you know, we've been working on uh, going through Ephesians and going uh, chapter by chapter. Uh, I've taken it as a course recently, so it's all fresh in my mind and in my heart. Um, I think one of my favorite things was how uh, my teacher explained that we always jump to chapter 6 where it talks about the armor of God. And he was like, but it, it, that's like the wrap up of everything else. And he talks about how we need to go through each of the other chapters first to get to the full armor of God, because you need to understand that there's the walking dead. Oh, I should do it by chapter by chapter. Uh, chapter one, um, Paul talks about uh, blessings and he begins to talk about a mystery revealed and that we're in a spiritual battle. Ephesians is the only place where Paul mentions it four times, and I don't mean like four times, it's the only place in all his letters that he talks about the spiritual battle. Um, and when he talks about like the heavenly places, he's not talking about something that's really far away, he's talking about everything that is around us currently and then that's what's going on and so as you go uh, chapter by chapter and he talks about um paul's very real you know because he was Saul, he became paul and the very thing he thought he was doing good for he realized was just how much he was missing the mark because christ had come down for jews and gentiles alike that the jews were supposed to be a representative to the rest of the world of who god was and instead they made it this exclusive club just for them and everyone else you you could figure it out on your own but you're not welcome here this is our god not yours and they missed it and god was like no 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 I came for everyone. Everyone is my child. Everyone is. And so uh, Paul, who had been hunting uh, Christians who used to be Jews, being like, you walked away? You walked away from what you knew and then put them on trial and had them killed as a warning to everyone else. He, he got hit the hardest when God revealed himself to him and was just like, you know, who are you? I'm the one you're persecuting. And then from then on, he realizes um, that he had missed the mark so completely and that all the Jews had missed the mark and that he, he needed to let everybody know that God had come for everyone, that he loves everyone. And so he talks about that. He talks about the spiritual battle. Then chapter two, he talked about um, the walking dead. And it's for us to realize two things. One, that they're very different than us now. But two, that we used to be them. <laughs> that we're no different than, right, the walking dead, people who don't know God. And we talked about, I, I call it a baseline, but it means worldview, the way we view the world and how they view the world, living according to the flesh and fulfilling desire and then looking to, to feed it some more and some more. And then how different that is than living by the Spirit living by God, living by, you know, the one who leads us into truth and realizing that this life is fairly temporary and that we have an eternity with God and that the reason why we're here is to do good works, that the reason why God created sunsets and sunrises is for our joy because <laughs> it was a beautiful thing and it pleased him. And the reason why you wake up and hear the, the birds sing and it's because he made it for our enjoyment, because it pleased him. And you can go through all, all of your senses and realize that God created, you know, the beautiful smell of flowers. He created music to have such an impact on who we are, because it pleased him. And um, we were created with identity and for purpose and for good, to do good, which is very different than just the way it is there where it's feed yourself, you know, uh, serve yourself. Um, and, and then what goals you create rather than the one who has the blueprints for your life and knows what you were made for. It's very different. And how, um, because their baseline is so different, their definition of what love is, is so different. And they just, when you serve yourself, you generally hurt people around you because you don't care as much about other people as you do yourself. Uh, so we, we learned about the walking dead, but the how also we were exactly the same and we had to be taken out of that. Um, chapter three goes also into the mystery reveal that we were meant to be one people. And chapter four starts talking about unity, which is what we'll dig into a little bit today and how we're supposed to treat each other within the church, right? Um, and how sometimes that, how sometimes in some churches, people don't treat others the way that they're supposed to. And there can be a lot of hurt, as, as mentioned. Sometimes words, words can hurt. And when we take it, it can truly, truly crush us. And so it talks about how we're supposed to treat each other. Okay. Oh, went backwards. Now I'll go to my first slide. So we're going through right now Ephesians uh, chapter 3. And I'm just going to plug away a little bit at a time here. So verse 8, though I am the least deserving of all of God's people, 
he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. Well, I love about this, and I didn't write it down, but when you first start going through the Pauline letters, he talks about his view of himself, and he's like, you know, I'm the worst of the apostles. He takes into consideration where he sat and was like, yeah, for what I have done, I'm the worst of the apostles. And then slowly, slowly, he's like, okay, so I'm the worst, you know, of God's people. And the closer he gets to God, the, the, the greater his journey and reflection of who God is compared to who he is. And the later you, you go through his letters, you, you get to this one. Uh, so this one is all God's people, but later he's like, and I'm the worst sinner of them all. So he goes from being the worst apostle to being the, you know, least deserving of God's people to being the worst sinner of them all. And his view of himself continues to change in light of who God is. And he looks at himself and it's just like, whoa. And it's an interesting transition as, as he goes on. And so he's like, even though this is where I sit, that I'm the least, that I am small, the humility that he shows allows for great growth. You know it takes humility to grow, right? Think of the opposite. If you have pride and someone tries to teach you something, you're like, yeah, I got this, I know this. I, it's a lot harder to mold your heart. It's a lot harder to give you wisdom when you think you know it all. When you come in and say, I know nothing, I am no one. You know, God mold me and shape me. It's very easy to be pliable. And even no matter where I go, people, well, it's because I'm, I have this title of pastor, and so people look up to me, and I'm like, no, 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 I am here to serve, <laughs> to serve all of you. I, like Jesus did it, how much more do I need to do it? And I still have so much to learn. One of my favorite quotes is talking to a nun who just said, you know, Luigi, I was seven, um, I've given up my life, everything, you know, in pursuit of God. And by the end of my life, I will know him about the size of a grain of sand on this earth. And that's just it. I have so much, so much to learn. And the learning process is a beautiful thing. So, um, gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles. This is the people who he never talked to before, <laughs> who were the unclean people that were, you know, no, we don't talk to the Gentiles. Those are the other people. The Jews are uh, God's people. Those are the clean people. Those are, and, and it's like, and now he's like, I'm the least, and he's given me a privilege about telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. So we went from like walking dead to, by the way, God loves you so much and he has so much to give you. If only you would take hold. If only, and he counts it as a privilege, right? It's hard when you go out there and you get hurt. You get hurt by people around you again and again and again and Paul's like used to that. He's hunted people and had them killed and now he's like, now I actually count it a privilege. And part of that privilege is suffering. God has allowed me to go into people's lives and share love and share grace and share, and they hurt me, but it's still a privilege. What a perspective that is. And then to be able to tell them, there's treasures for you. God loves you, and he's given up like everything for you, and he's created everything for, for beauty, for joy, for you to enjoy, if only you take a hold of them. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. I, I love that he reinforces the creator of all things. Because like I said, when, when I look out and I see sunset and sunrise and birds sing and uh, panther stalking or running with corded muscles and just the way God created it, such a beautiful animal and, and how God created music to have such an impact. And he's like, the creator of all things. And there's the verse that says that God is obvious to everyone because his fingerprint of our maker is all around us. It's there. It's evident to see, right? That, that this isn't an accident that we're here, but that God had purpose. So I get to explain this mysterious plan that God, creator of all things, had kept secret from the very beginning. And a couple of verses before when he talks about uh, the mysterious plan, uh, it, it's a mystery because you're missing a piece of information. And so the piece of information he gets to give now is saying, the Holy Spirit has come, <laughs> right? They could not see, they could not understand pre-Christ. And, and when you read your Bible and you go through and it says the Holy Spirit came upon, and came upon, came upon Samson and he had great strength, or 
But now it says Holy Spirit lives within us. It's not just around us, but within us and leads us into truth. And so our eyes are open. We can begin to see. We can approach God like in his throne room where, where his presence is and say, God, I can take a hold of you. I can have a conversation with you. <laughs> that you can see through all my sin and you love me to pieces and, and the price has been paid. And so it's not like just instant death. It's I get to spend time with God. And so the Holy Spirit is available. God's purpose in all this was to use the church. So for the record, when it says church, it means ecclesia and it means gathering of people. When it says church, it's God's children coming together. It's a unity of coming together. It's not a building, <laughs> right? I've long ago said, if we lost a building, it makes no difference. But we can meet at Tim Hortons, we can meet in the field, you can meet at my house, I'll cook for you. <laughs> you know, it, it makes no difference. It's a gathering of people when we're together, when we love each other. There, that's what church is. So God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety. The rich variety is very important. Humanity continues to find ways to divide us. They'll find anything and everything color of your skin, shape and size, where you're from, uh, boy, girl, like they'll find every dividing aspect that they can find to divide and say you're different. No, that difference is a beautiful thing that needs to be enjoyed because God is a wonderful creator who makes people different, very different. But when we come together, we create his church, his body. We create what we're supposed to be when we operate in harmony and in love and we're all different. Now don't get me wrong, sometimes people's differences can grate on you. <laughs> sometimes they can be annoying. And that's why later on Paul talks about that and says, you have to allow for each other's faults. We're all in a growing process. You're not instantly made perfect the second you say, I believe in God. Well, that's it. You're all set. No, it's a process and we all mess up all the time. And so it says to put up with each other and to allow for. We all make mistakes. I I'm glad that you can all allow for when I screw up, <laughs> that you guys put up with me, you know, thank you for that. Otherwise, I wouldn't get to have the relationship I get to have with you. You know that in, in all your relationships, when you, you come to a place where, where you butt heads, it's like this, this branch, this transition piece where you either be like, well, that's it. I can't handle this anymore. I can't take this anymore. I'm never talking to them again. And you break apart. Or you sit and say, that's it. Lock up the doors. My wife did this to me once. Um, before we got married, she was like, I need to see my husband angry because I've never seen him angry before. And before I could marry him, I need to know how, how he reacts. And... and and I like, I need to go for a walk. She threw a dictionary at my head that night. Oh, oh, see, now it's all coming in. And, and so I'm like, we, we were very, we, <laughs> we were upset. And I'm like, you know what? I need to go for a walk. And she ran to the door and locked it and said, nope. <laughs> and I'm like, but, but no, this is how I deal with all those emotions swimming inside of me. And she's like, nope, because she's a person who needs to be confrontational and have things figured out immediately. And yes, I ended up on the, in the fetal position on the couch. So <laughs> she, she lets me go for walks now. <laughs> I, don't, I don't deal it in an explosive way. But see, now I've like, lost my train of thought. You gave me all those laughs and stares. And <laughs> she put ups with me. <laughs> God creates us each differently. But when you hit a crossroads of like, what do we do? When you choose to lock the door and stay in the same room and choose to overcome, to heal, to push through the differences, you grow closer together. Because imagine like the same thing happens again, but like, you know what? We covered this. <laughs> we know the solution. And you can overcome it the next time. If you choose it, if you allow it to defeat you, and that's it. How are you ever going to like repair that? How are you ever going to? But, but when you're stuck there and it's like, no, no, God has asked us to heal and we're going to put in the effort and we're going to heal, then you're made stronger. Your relationship becomes stronger because you've overcome. But that means you have to put in the effort to sit and say, oh, it doesn't matter how offended I'm going to feel. It doesn't matter this hurt, this anger. God has asked me not to go to sleep tonight until I've made this right and I'm going to heal it and I'm going to much better that way not not everyone has to go for a walk some people do but you know 
give them five, 10 minutes, an hour, and then it's like, okay, now we still have to have that conversation. You can't run away. There's a difference between taking a walk to calm yourself and be rational, and, and, but still not completely running away from the issue. We, we need to deal with it. And it's hard. It's hard. But it's good that it's hard because then we heal and grow from it. God created rich variety to come together, to be able to fill in the gaps that we're not so good at. And he's just masterful in the way he does it. He's God. I mean, <laughs> it's this beautiful mosaic, this puzzle piece that comes together so perfectly. And when we are in unity and in one heart and in one mind, and sorry, I think of the day of Pentecost. It says the Holy Spirit comes. And like it talks about the Holy Spirit coming. Then right after that, it says they were all of one heart and one mind. And I feel like that should come just a little bit before, <laughs> right? Because it they were of one heart and one mind. And when they had finally got to that place where they were praying of one heart and one mind, seeking God, that God's like, all right, here I come, <laughs> right? Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. That God was waiting. And they, they, they came to that place and wow, did Holy Spirit come. And so God created rich variety that should be celebrated. It is absolutely amazing when people that I've invested in and poured into do way better than I ever could. <laughs> I've done my job. I've prayed with and encouraged and supported and equipped and said, go, now go do what God has asked you to do. And, and when they flourish, I celebrate. I don't have to be that awesome. They could be that awesome. I'm totally good with that. May they flourish and be who God has made them to be. And, and I'm just happy watching the world around me become better and more beautiful and I'm good sitting on, on the sides and watching that. Uh, sometimes we don't do that. Sometimes we see people who, who get better. Can you imagine someone you train get better than you? Can you imagine being like a karate teacher where you've been like training and you're like, I'm like a double black belt with ninth degree and I've trained this person and they've now done better than I ever have. I'm not sure if they struggle with that. I imagine they would because they've been training significantly longer, but at some point their, their students surpass. That should be celebrated. We have troubles with that. We have trouble seeing other people succeed where, where we fail. But we should celebrate. God has created a rich variety and people will be better. We're all different, all important. Each puzzle piece is important. You know, when you think of like a brick building, if you take one brick out, the two that's sitting on top of that one kind of do this a little bit. They don't have that support. There is no brick that is more important than another brick. We're all so important. And even if someone's better at you, well, I'll never forget being, it was Woodbury College, boo. There were these brothers, these twins. I've said this story before, but I like saying it. These twins, okay? And they were perfect at everything. I'm telling you, they, they, they were like valedictorian. They were the president council. They were in football. And one was the quarterback and the other one was a receiver. Except he always threw to his brother. And it didn't matter if the other team was like, listen, you want three guys on this one guy. He still managed to get the ball and always got the touchdown. There was just no stopping them. And they did this talent show where, where they did this like break dancing and then they both like ran up the wall and did a backflip in, in unison. And I was just like, they were straight A students. They could play musical instruments. Where do they get the time for all this? How do they do all that? I, I was slightly jealous. Oh my God, like when it came time to the pool of, of things, <laughs> I guess you ran out when it came to me. <laughs> right like look at them that comparison game is dangerous when, when you compare you're putting yourself down you're defeating yourself and, and you're not taking the time from the creator of all things who created you masterfully just the way he needed to that there are certain things that only you can do that the good works that he has prepared in you to do for you you know god doesn't need you he can do it all himself he's god but he wants to he shares in the beauty. He shares in the making this world a better place. Like he, He's part of it in you, through you, and you partnership together. Do you know how beautiful it is one day to go before God and been like, and God's like, I asked you to do this, and you listened. Thank you. And, and being there and be like, Dad, I just wanted to make you proud. I just wanted you to be happy at me. I just wanted to serve. I love you. Like how special that is. He created good things for us to do in partnership with him. And he shares in this beautiful journey that we're supposed to be doing. I'm so off. Anyway, rich variety. 
He's made us all differently, but to work in harmony. And it's not easy. And, and, and this is why God goes really into it, or Paul goes into it, and it's like, okay, but we grate on each other's nerves, and we're going to have to overcome that. Okay. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom, uh, not his screw-up, his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, which, like I said, isn't up there. It's all around. He's like, these are my kids. Watch what they do. Yeah, yeah, they mess up, but watch what they do. Watch what they accomplish. Watch the church come one heart, one mind, and watch. It's a joy to God. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord, which would make him the head. And so he gave us an immense amount of gifts. And so you'll see the, the link at the end. Um, I do have printed copies if you'd like a printed copy, but the online version has it so that you can click, hit calculate, it says it for you, and then it says, can you define for me? And then it gives you all the definitions of spiritual giftings. And you have from like um, speaking in tongues, miracles, administration, mercy, uh, pastor, teacher, leader. Uh, th there's like 17, 18 of them. Uh, and it's just a good way to get to know yourself a little bit to see how God has equipped you in, in one way. But then he's also given us apostles and prophets and pastors and all to unify, to help unify, to help bring together so that we are working in harmony. And I constantly remind you guys that here in the Western world is different than the Eastern world where, you know, they value having family. So when, when you have a child, your grandparents are very much involved and live with you. You're taking care of them. They took care of you when you were younger. Now you take care of them. And it's like, all right, you're going to help grow your, your grandchildren. We're here. We're like, oh, we'll put them in a home. <laughs> right? Our, our parents get to a certain age and like, oh, they're annoying. We'll put them in a home. Um, we, we see things differently. We become more individualistic. But God's God's family is supposed to be all completely united. That age doesn't matter whatsoever. We're all supposed to be here together that those very differences you're supposed to celebrate. And he gives us gifts to allow for that unity. I am incredibly uh, grateful. Okay, I didn't. Glow, I'm very grateful for you that you pray like all week long, that you cover me in prayer, you cover this church, that God places people in your heart. I, I know, I know I'm like singling you out. And, but I, I just, I pray, I last 10 minutes, and then I'm a sniveling mess on the floor, and I'm like, that's it, I'm done. And, and somehow Glow can do it for hours, and I'm just, and God just works through her. And I know those prayers have fruition. That she, she beseeches, and I'm like, so grateful for some of the other gifts that God has given each and every one of you that you all work in different ways. But when we come together, the power that that has. And so God does it. Okay, so I've done a lot of this. Ooh, ooh. Um, previously, we talked about how God has adopted us into his family. And the idea of adoption is an incredible, beautiful thing, especially with the backdrop of Paul in his culture and society, right? Where you had to either go to war for a long period of time to earn enough money to have Roman citizenship, that that's what they like tried for. And like I mentioned, 87% of the people were slaves or farmers uh, who did not own their own land, which means you were just a farmer for someone else, which was just slightly better than a slave anyways. Okay. Um, and 10% of people were uh, mercenaries. I kept thinking missionaries. No, mercenaries. <laughs> that's why I still. So they, they were mercenaries for hire, and, and their goal was to get survive long enough to have enough money to buy Roman citizenship. So that way you could kind of be part of the elite. So all of a sudden, everyone's like, you know, it's impossible to ever be uh, part of that community. It, we're stuck in our lot, and, and here's Paul saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> Christ died for you. He paid a price so that you enter into his family. There isn't anything you have to pay. It's free, and it's welcome to all. And, and so he was drastically saying, like, don't, don't worry about the way our world works. God's world works very differently. You are all part of. And as um, Christianity began that movement, and, and peop, even the Romans who were impacted by it began to say, hey, slaves, I'm setting you free. And now, it doesn't matter if you're 40 years old, I'm also adopting you back into my family. I have to set you free as a slave first, so now you're free, but now I'm adopting you into my family, so that way I can give you an inheritance. That way you're just part of what I have here. And it began to severely change the way the Roman Empire ran things, because more and more people saw it that way. 
and it shifted and changed from this idea of dominance to this idea of we're all equal. And this is what Paul is saying, is all adopted into one family with rich variety, with differing gifts that God has given in order to come in unity. And it is an incredibly beautiful thing. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. I highlighted the inner strength. God doesn't necessarily give us the exterior strength that we need in order to push forward sometimes. Sometimes I get to the end of my week and my bed calls to me and I'm just like, uh, and then someone else calls and I'm like, I guess we'll meet later. <laughs> and I go meet up with my friend. Uh, I meant my bed. Like, I wasn't going to meet with my bed anymore. I was going to go meet with my friend, <laughs> right? It, it's just that sometimes uh, we get weary. We get like, there's a lot of things that happen in life. But he gives us an inner strength. And that inner strength allows us to, in the face of the walking dead, of a different world around us, to be able to walk forward and be like, no, this isn't going to tear me down. In a battle that is happening around us, spiritual, that we cannot see, that is constantly going on, he gives us the inner strength to stand firm. Sorry, this is like chapter six kind of <laughs> leading into, right? He because the amount of times that it says, and stand strong, and stand firm, and stand, in, in chapter 6 is very evident, and this is what he's saying. You need that inner strength to know your identity in Christ, who you are, what you were made for, that the very differences he made in you, Moses, and who made your mouth, but God, I don't talk so good, but who made your mouth? You think I don't know? <laughs> and in your weakness, I will be made strong. The more we trust in God, the more we lean on God, the more we realize he'll never let us down. A and then what kind of strength do you actually need externally anyways? If you have God with you, what his will is gets accomplished. And if that's what you're aiming for, Father, may your will be done, but not mine, <laughs> on earth as it is in heaven, less of me, more of you then as he accomplishes and you get to be a part of that, you realize, I can do anything <laughs> through God who gives me strength. You know how encouraging that is? Do you know how when you actually start walking that, and believe me, when you start walking it, there's all kinds of things that come against you and your heart gets smushed and broken and, and it's like, there's so much pain going on around me, God, why? And he's like, just trust me. Just lean on me. I'll give you the strength to push through this. And then what's great is that he uses all that brokenness, we live in a very broken world, to give you more strength, an inner strength. And again, that inner strength comes from trusting in God. Your definition of love will grow according to your trust in God. All right, I should continue. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you, oh, look, that's, that's what, it said it first, not me. I was just reiterating. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. As you. Again, it's not instantaneous. When you come to know God, not everything gets fixed. You enter into a refinement process. And it's a beautiful thing. As you. So as you go more in trust, more in trust, more in trust, his home becomes more and more in you. I think that he's permanently in there, but your recognition of him being in there may be off. There's people that have told me, you know, Spirit of God is here when this happens, and then Spirit of God is gone. And then Spirit of God is here when, and then Spirit of God is gone. And I'm like, I think you missed something. God's not a light switch. <laughs> he, there's no on and off. He's here always. Not just around me, but in me. If I think there's an off, it's because something I have done or the way I perceive it has put him at a distance because he is always here. He is always with you no matter what you go through. No matter what circumstances are, he loves you and he is always with you. There is no on and off. Holy Spirit is here and here to stay. This is why Christ died. Not so he had the option of sending the Spirit, but so that it was always in harmony with us when we were trying to do God's will and empowering us to whew, make a difference to the living dead out there. And so as you trust him more and more, the more you see it inside. And it's like, 
Oh, he's there. He's there. I need to give him more space. I need to trust him more. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. It means you need to be strong against something, right? Something that's trying to make you weaker. Something that's trying to break you. Something that's, again, as you live in a broken world, pain comes. It comes. But it's amazing when you read the Bible and when pain comes, they're celebrating. I got thrown in jail. It's okay. I'm going to start talking to the jailer about God. Earthquake happens. Shackles get broken. Doors swing open. It's like, look, God, let us go. We're not going anywhere. Jailer comes in ready to kill himself because it's like, great, I just let all the prisoners escape. It's going to be my head out there. <laughs> like, my life is at risk here. And, they, and they're like, no, 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 don't do that. We didn't go anywhere. And he invites them over to their house and they talk about God and he gives his life and his whole family gives their lives to God. They celebrate during struggle. They're like, huh, God's prepared me for this. God has allowed me to be strong in him. I can trust him. He'll take me through this. Storms come, but you don't need to be afraid. You got to be like Peter, you know, walk out on the water and realize, <gasps> he starts sinking. And it's like, why do you have so little faith? Let it grow. Trust in me. And you'll be able to take more steps. <laughs> Keep your eyes on me. You'll, you'll get more steps in <laughs> as you walk on water. The storms come. It's terrifying. Life is terrifying. There's all kinds of things that go wrong. There's flooding a week or so ago doesn't matter. We're in the palm of his hand. Put a smile on your face and trust him and watch how your roots grow. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. We need to grow more and more in love with God. And the more we do, the more we understand his love. And the more we understand his love, the greater our love capacity grows. I'm constantly praying this. This has been like my, my year of, dear God, continue to redefine, refine what love is. I need it more. I need to understand it more so that I can better give it to the people around me. So that I can trust in you and know that love is something that can only be given away. I can't take it from anyone. And in fact, when, when I try to take it, the more it seems to just completely disappear. It is when I give it away freely without asking for anything in return that it multiplies for some reason. It doesn't make any sense. But Jesus broke bread and said, all right, here you go. And then the disciples broke bread and said, oh, here you go. And 5,000 people were, were fed. He was showing them the way God's kingdom works. When you break and you give it away, it multiplies. Love is something that needs to be refined, redefined constantly, and then given away for free. Pain will come, and that's okay. You respond with love, because love is eternal. Love overcomes. Love shines light, and nothing can come against that. And again, to quote, you know, 1 John chapter 4, and God is love. Yeah, nothing can ever come against that. So may you begin to understand as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it's too great to understand fully. He's overwhelmed by it. Even the way he writes it, he's overwhelmed in this moment. It's like, even though it's, it's just too big to fully understand. But may you experience, experience. It's not just a revelation, it's an experience. I, I don't like having formulas to be like, to get to know God, you must do this, 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 this. And it's like, you need to experience God. To experience God, you need to empty out yourself a little bit. You need to come humbly and say, I don't know it all, and God, I need you. <laughs> so do what you need to do and help me experience. Because when you have that experience, no one can take that away from you. If I try to use my head knowledge to convince you about God, someone who's smarter than me will come by and unconvince you. And we'll go back and forth. <laughs> this doesn't work so much. It, it could be swayed with a better argument, with more intelligence, with... But when you have an experience with God, when the Holy Spirit fills your heart and, and miracles happen, there's no explaining that, is there? But you have had an experience with God and no one could ever take that away from you. Seek experiences with God. And again, at the basis of that comes trust. So you need to trust in God, which means the only way you're going to get to begin to trust God is when you're on shaky ground, is when the storms come, so that your faith gets tested. 
The only way Peter would ever have known that his faith was lacking was for it to be tested. But at least he got out of the boat. The other guys didn't. <laughs> he got out and realized, whoa, I'm lacking in faith. I fell in. <laughs> Thank God <laughs> that he caught me. <laughs> I was going down, but he caught me. And, and he let me know I have little faith, so it needs to grow. But it's time to step out of the boat again and again and again. Your faith needs to be tested in order for it to grow, for you to realize and trust. So it's amazing how God does that. You need to experience difficulties to trust in God. He's designed it that way. You go through the hard times and are tested so you can realize where your heart is sitting at. And as you trust more, your love grows. And God comes through again and again and again. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Then you'll be made complete. As you enter that refining process, and it grows in you, and grows in you, you, you get, to, get to a point where it's complete. That's usually death and when you're in heaven. <laughs> when everything is full, and done, and said, and written, and done. So just know that we got a road ahead of us, so long as you got breath, okay? But it does get made complete one day. Everything else gets washed away in comparison. You don't remember the pain. You don't remember the tears. It's all completely washed away, and you have been made complete. What I love about that is um, with the fullness of life. When you live with the idea of self-preservation, you don't live a full life. You're so worried. You're so concerned. What if I lose this? I need to acquire this. This will give me security, and I need to have that. And, and, and whew, I don't know how people live life like that. It's hard. <laughs> For them, it's just, no, no, this is my security, and if I finish paying off my mortgage, my house, I got my house, it's my security, and then I'll be able to do this, and this, and this. And God's like, no, no, let all of that go. You don't take any of that with you anyways. Trust in me. And when the storms come, and you can face it with a smile, you will have a fullness of life that no one else can actually understand. When you can stand and say, no, God is helping me to grow. He's helping my faith to grow. He's teaching me more about his love. This is why I was created, to enjoy relationship with him, to enjoy love with him, and for it to be redefined and grown in me more and more and more. And as I understand it more, the smile on my face just gets bigger and bigger and bigger as I surrender all of who I am to God. God, I love you. And I need only you. In the face of everything else that happens, it's irrelevant. May I lose it all? Who cares? Because I will always have you. What is it gain a man for him to inherit everything and lose his soul? No, I'm holding on to my soul. My soul is my connection to God. It is my eternity with God. And I'm guarding that above everything else. Everything else washes away anyways. And then you enjoy a fullness of life. And where does it come? And power. <laughs> That comes from God. That power is that courage. As your trust is refined and you stand before a difficult moment, you're like, <laughs> God's got me. It's okay. And people just look at you like, you're crazy. <laughs> How can all this happen before you? <laughs> you don't have insurance. Your house just flooded. How can you smile? <laughs> God's got me. God's got me. It's okay. A fullness of life. And a power that comes from God. No one can take that away from you. <laughs> Nothing anyone can do could ever take that away from you. So he prays for us to have inner strength. And we get that from the Holy Spirit. It's great. I wrote these notes and I feel like I've just talked about them all anyways. But let's consider it a summary. Um, inner strength. Holy Spirit. Difficult times. Faith. Growing. Trust. As you trust in him, he makes his home in your heart. And again, that means it's a process. And again, I remind you that as people walk into the building and they're at different parts of their process, don't sit here and judge. I mean, what, what if they don't believe, but they still want to hang out with you? <laughs> this is where they're supposed to be. And again, not necessarily in this building, but with you, with each and every one of you. Because when we work in that harmony and that love and we cover each other, they're, they're like... I want to be a part of that. And then they begin to see God's love. And then they have to contrast that with what their definition of love is. And they're like, oh, mine's not so good. That one's way better. But that may be a process. 
Because they may come in here full of sin, full of whatever they've chosen in life, addictions or whatnot, and, and come in and expect judgment when we instead respond with love, and God is love. They start to know who he is. Last week, I, I quoted the, the uh, Hebrews where it talks about, I should have put it up there again, but um, the power behind God's word, the power and life behind God's word and how it separates bone and marrow, soul and spirit, and it reveals our innermost thoughts, our desires get completely revealed. Let God's word do that. We're not here to judge. That's a heavy burden to hold on to. Let God do the judging. Let him do it. <laughs> Release that. <laughs> you don't need to worry about that. Your job is to love. Your job is to train yourself to see beyond the sin. Believe me, that's what the rest of the world does. All they see is the sin. They see the, oh, oh. don't fall into that trap. Can you imagine if God, when he looked at you, all he saw was that? Yep, dead. That's, that's what I deserve. That's the end of my life. <laughs> I am a sinful man. I deserve death. If all God saw was my sin, it's done. What's the point of all this? But somehow he pierces through it. Gave up his life for it to be washed away. We're called to be like him. To see through the sin and into the hearts, and, and see the potential, the beauty in people, and be like, there, there's God's child. That needs to grow. And so I need to love them. The world teaches them that doesn't work like that. And you're like, no, 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 it works exactly like that. Love is something that needs to be given away for free, and pain's going to come, and I don't care. God's given me that power to overcome. All right, what did I write? That means it is a process. That trust isn't completely fully made instantly. It's a growing trust. And as that trust grows, we become inside stronger because he makes our home inside of us. So again, months can go by, years can go by. And you're like, are they even Christian? They keep coming to church. They've been here for a couple of years. Does it matter? Let God's word do what it needs to do inside their hearts. You continue to love on them. They continue to show up. <laughs> There's impact will come through. I believe that God's word has life and power. And God will do what he needs to do inside of their hearts. The Holy Spirit is alive and at work. And when we pray, when we love, when we care, when we, it'll sink in eventually. Because darkness can't stand against that. Yeah, I'm good there. Wow, I wrote a lot of notes. We're at 1210. It's a good place to stop. You can say, ah, oh, again. <laughs> I know it's taking me a little longer than I, than I had envisioned, but I'm okay with it. it. It's all so revealing. Each part of this, as, as we go through it and read and learn about what Paul has written, and I think it's, like I said, his, his manifesto. I think it's like his summary of, guys, we had it wrong. We judged the world around us. We saw them as apart from God and didn't realize how apart from God we were. And then he came and died, not just for us, but for them too. And now... He has shared with us and given us the privilege to understand this so that we can go out and show them what they've missed all along. We can bring them from death to life just as God has brought us from death to life. Why wouldn't you want to share that with everyone? It's a free gift. God has given it to you for free. Why wouldn't you want to share that with everyone around you? If you've ever been blessed immensely and just sit there and be like, whoa, wow. I don't deserve that, but what a blessing. And, and how do I, don't, don't you wish other people feel the same way? <laughs> that they are blessed, <laughs> that they can feel loved, that they can feel, if you take the moment to analyze that moment where you are just so blessed in one way or another, and it's like, well, I love everything I'm feeling right now. Someone out there loves and cares for me, and they gave up of themselves for me. Then why wouldn't you want to share that with everyone else? Especially if it's free to do so. You have knowledge. You have wisdom. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of your heart, teaching you truth, teaching you love. And all you got to do is share it. Again, it's okay to feel the pain. It's okay when people hurt you in return. So what? So did Christ. And we're asked to do exactly as he has done. It's going to come. Get used to the pain. Let it toughen you up a little bit. And trust in God. And let it refine me. And I'm going to trust you more and more and more. And... I will be the first to admit I'm not very good at that. But that's why I have each and every one of you. 
so that when I struggle, I can come to you and say, I'm really struggling with this in my life right now. And you can pray with me and you can encourage me. You can show me how you have had faith maybe in that moment. And you can help me grow too. We are one family, one people, and diverse and different. And when we come together like that, that's what makes us unstoppable. Not by myself. Not all the self-help books I'm trying to make myself better. It's when I rely on each one of you as you rely on God, as I rely on God. And we come together like that. And they were of one heart and of one mind. And the Holy Spirit came down like a roaring whirlwind, burst open the doors, and tongues of flame went on their heads. And there were miracles. And they spoke in tongues. And 3,000 people were saved that day. And, 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 and. Be glad of the refining process. All right, will you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, I'm the first to admit that it's hard. That you put us into positions where everything gets tested, where, where we realize where we truly stand. And it's easy to, to fall into the world's trap and be like, I can't do this, and this is a struggle, and I want to pull away, and I want to give up. And, and everyone would understand if I gave up because it's so painful. Yet we live by different rules. We live by trust in you. And it's hard. And it's hard. But God, you created family. You created a a church, a gathering of people in your name to be able to help us overcome in those moments. So as individualistic as we take it, God, would you strip that away and remind us that we are one family? And even the walking dead out there as they walk in here are still part of your family. You died for them too. God, help us to share unabashedly. At some point in time when when we were younger, as, as children, we trusted our parents and if we had good ones, they, they were able to, to guide us through life and encourage us and help us to grow. And, and then at some point, we, we realized we became individuals and we pulled away. But then it says, this is why uh, a man leaves father and mother and clings to his wife and the two become one. And it, there was always partnership involved. We were always meant to go through this together every step of the way. And we had this, this beautiful innocence as a child that I pray returns, that we can trust in you as our Father, completely, to provide, to protect, to care for, to help us to grow, to help us to learn, and to help us understand that we're not in it alone. We are one family all together. We're supposed to unabashedly, as children, love each other. And yes, that means sometimes the hurt will come. But God, give us the strength that we need to recognize it for what it is and respond with that, from that pain with love, with grace, with mercy, as a representation of what you have done for us. May we grow in you, God, and may we show your love to the world around us, no matter what happens our way. May we grow in trust, in strength, in power, in wisdom. May we understand your love more and more each day. How deep, how wide, how long, just how great it is, Lord. Redefine our love every day, Lord. Refine it till we understand it more and more and more so we could give it so freely away to the people around us. Give us courage, Lord, and test us. That's a dangerous thing to pray for. Lord, test us so we know where we stand and we can make the adjustments inside of our hearts as they should be to grow closer to you. Do a work inside every person here, Lord. May we draw close to you and respond, Lord. Respond, may we hear your voice every day. May we feel the tug of the Holy Spirit as you guide us into the good things that you have planned so long ago to do. Lord, I always pray that you protect and watch over us as we lead our, our lives every day. Give us opportunity to make a difference in this world, to do those good works. In Jesus' mighty name, we all pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. Tim and Carol, would you like to come up and help us close in a song of worship?